The word genius is misused. This man was a genius. Right, so those are the two. There are extended go lay codes. There's all sorts of things you can do. Right. Now, say you use a Nordstrom-Robinson code and you get a pile of reflections and you maximize the entropy of each one. You've then got 256 solutions to look at. So you sit down at your terminal and you look through 256 maps and you look at the first one with some care and the second one and the third one and then you look at the fourth one briefly and for the fifth one you go and get a cup of coffee. By the time you've got to map number 10, you are tearing your hair out and unless you're a PhD student with a supervisor from hell, you never actually finish it. So you need some way of selecting them. Well, what do you want to do? You want to look and see how well your map has predicted the reflections that you put in and how well it has predicted the reflections you didn't put in. So it's going to look, you need some sort of function, oops, I've got to stop this, but that measures how your UOBs and your UMEs agree. And so you do this. Now, I don't believe in going through mathematics in a situation like this. And, uh, the people who understand it already know it, and the people who don't know it aren't going to learn it from this. <laughs> so you need to sit and... I've written it all out in the notes. Well, you have all this lovely mathematics, but you're going to generate a thing called log likelihood gain, LLGs, things here. And the point about this is that it looks pretty awful, but actually it's very straightforward to understand. It's got this function i0, which you're going to see from time to time in a lot of talks. This is a modified Bessel function of the first kind, and it looks like that, just to uh, be clear. Right, the likelihood takes your observed data and sees how well you've predicted it. It can do a lot of other things, too. It can tell you about your unit cell contents, envelopes, non-crystallographic symmetry, etc. Right. How am I doing? Yeah, good. I won't bother with that. Right, or bother with that. So this is the entropy method. You calculate a whole pile of, of possible phase sets using error correcting codes. You maximize the entropy of each one. You calculate the likelihood, and then you analyze the likelihood, and you pick out the maps that have got the best likelihood values, and you look at those. And typically, you don't need to look at very many. So what are the limitations of this method? Well, first of all, it's not the quickest way to do things. It's quite a slow procedure. And with high quality, high resolution data, it is wholly uncompetitive. It's not going to do, it, there's no way it can compete with model building methods, for example, in powder diffraction. What it is really good at is where you have got poor data, where the data have low resolution, they're incomplete, they're subject to error. And so it's particularly good for electron diffraction data, but it works very nicely with powders too. So what do you do? There's a computer program I wrote many years ago and have been working on ever since called MICE, which solves these things. So you normalize the data, you select some strong U values, you permute the codes, you, the, the phases with error correcting codes, you maximize the entropy of each one, you select the best solutions with likelihood, we'll worry about the histograms later, and then you get a look at the maps. So let's have a look at electron diffraction. Sorry about the pictures. I was getting really bored in the airport yesterday. So I had a five hour wait. So I started putting photographs in my pen. Right, so here's, uh, here's a structure that uh, some Doug Dorsett's data. It's a very typical sort of thing. It's actually uh, three dimensional data, which is pretty good. So it's only got 125 unique reflections. You can solve that in a matter of a few minutes because it uh, looks like that. Just to point out that looking at maximum entropy maps themselves is a very bad idea. If you actually calculate a maximum entropy method map using this method and look at it, you will be sorely disappointed. It looks truly dreadful. And that's because in the maximum entropy ma map, is a prediction of absolutely every single reflection within the 
the resolution range of, of your data. And half that data isn't there. Half of it's unmeasured and things. And so the maps look poor. They need to be filtered. You need to filter out the information that's of poor quality. And that's done with a thing called centroid maps, where essentially all you need to know here, unless you want to do it for yourself, is that you're going to filter them. And you're going to actually take every extrapolated reflection and you're going to give it a weight. And that weight will make a weighted Fourier. And the weights are calculated, again, in a very straightforward way. We won't do Babinet maps. I'll do that. Just to point out, if you're an um, electron diffractionist, there's no reason why this method can't predict the missing cone reflections or anything that's missing. And that's just an example of output showing you that it has actually predicted reflections. So here are the ones with stars. It's actually predicted the observed U magnitude and also a phase angle. It's actually predicting these things. Whether they're any use is another matter, of course. Right. Uh, how am I doing for time? Yeah, I'm doing OK for time. Likelihood's OK but it's never going to be perfect, no technique is. So another way of filtering maps, of deciding what you're going to look at, is to look at density histograms. Now protein crystallographers have been using these since the dawn of time. They actually um, they know that they have a, a, a protein molecule, they know they have solvent, and they know there's a high contrast between these two areas. So. They can use a technique called solvent flattening, but they also can generate histograms, density histograms, for their data and use that for solvent flattening. And it's obviously has been work at ETH by uh, Christian Berlocker and Lynn McCuskus who have done this. So let's just have a look. So density histograms, for those who haven't met density histograms, they're just the same thing you get in your camera, your digital camera, when you bring up information about your photograph. It tells you about the intensity of your pixels, which is up here, and how many pixels there are with that intensity. Okay, so it's just, it's just a histogram of intensities. And that's one for an idealized of, uh, zeolite. So you can actually generate histograms from ideal structures. So what you can do then is in maximum entropy, indeed any method, you can do a structure solution. And here we look at about 24 maps per likelihood, and you calculate a histogram for each one. And that's a very quick and easy thing to do. And you correlate the histogram that you've measured with the histograms that's calculated for ideal data, and you choose the ones with high correlation coefficients. Another little point, when you do correlations in any way, th the tendency is... No, uh, I'll master this by the end, um, is to do this. This is the standard correlation coefficient between x and y. You've got a table of x values, table of y values, and you correlate them one at a time. And it's OK. That's the Pearson correlation coefficient, about 100 years old. There is a second way of doing it that I can strongly recommend that's actually a Spearman correlation coefficient. In this case... Instead of using the actual values of uh, x, you use their ranks. You sort the data in order, and then you correlate them by their rank. And that gives you actually quite a robust correlation coefficient. If you've got noisy data with a lot of outliers, I strongly recommend you use this rather than this. So what do we do? We do exactly as we've done before go around doing everything else, calculate the maps, and you filter them with density histograms to get the maps. And it works a treat, so this is electron diffraction data again. And I must say, with the electron diffraction data, I am assuming the data are kinematic. I'm doing no dynamical corrections or anything else. So these are some zeolites I did with Doug Dorset. These are the sort of things you get. Notice you haven't got that much data. 155 reflections at 1.3 angstroms. This is even worse. This is 27 2D data at two angstroms. Works quite well. Notice, though, at this sort of resolution, one peak is actually two atoms. Powder diffraction. K 
can this work for powder diffraction? Well, yes, you do it. You do exactly the same thing, except you've got to modify the theory to take into account the fact that you have got overlap data. And that means you've got to modify the likelihood. And again, I will not go through this in any detail at all, but what you do for this situation is you look under a given envelope and decide how many reflections are under that in this envelope, the total intensity and the indices of the reflections that are there. You don't have to do this very precisely. It can be actually, it, it's not particularly sensitive to getting it totally correct. And, it's that, and that's useful because it can be a problem at high, uh, a high resolution. So then you go through all this and there's no way you're going to read all this particularly as it's got things like confluent hypergeometric functions in it, which are an absolute nightmare to work with sometimes. But they look like that. Anyway, if ever you get a problem that is, has formulae like this in it and you get totally stuck, well, just go to numerical recipes, it will have, which is my Bible. When, I go, when I'm left on a desert island, the book I want to have with me is numerical recipes. How sad can you get? Uh, but anyway, you will be able to do, you, be, you can calculate these things routinely from, from things like that. And so you've got these things there, they don't really matter. So let's have a look at solving zeolite structures from this sort of thing. There's a lot of pro programs, obviously, that you know about that solve crystal structures from powders. The one that's, that's really the key program for zeolites, and I'm talking about zeolites for the moment, is focus because it knows about the geometry of zeolites and what it's looking for. So EMM3, this, this is some data I worked with Doug Dorsett on. So this is, let me explain what we're trying to do here actually. We're going to take the data at about one and a half, two angstroms. We're not going to try at this stage to find the atoms. We're trying to find envelopes was the idea. So, th so this is an envelope for this particular structure, and it's not bad in actual fact. It looks better down there. And the idea was, well, can you get an envelope and then use that as a constraint in other programs? And uh, that bit of the research has never actually been done. We can prove you can get an envelope, but we've never actually used it. EMM8, again. Don't need to worry about the details, but you get, you get good routine envelopes. And these calculations on my little laptop take less than five minutes. And again, doing that. Oh, I've got even more of these things. Right, charge flipping. Now, we haven't had the charge flipping lecture yet, so I'm jumping the gun. But charge flipping has been quite a revolutionary method for solving structures from diffraction data. Now what I'm going to do with charge flipping is try it with low resolution data, with one and a half, two angstrom resolution data, electron diffraction data and powder data. Now this is a dumb thing to do because if you read the papers on charge flipping they tell you that this won't work and well, I've spent my life doing dumb things, but it seemed to be a reasonable thing to try. So what I'm going to do here is just run Superflip on this difficult data and then take the solutions from Superflip and feed them into the maximum entry program. So I'm going to do Superflip, and you'll understand more about that in about two hours' time, and I'm just going to feed them into maximum entry. I'm going to do 100 possible phase sets. So you do 100 phase sets, and typically when you do it with this data, it doesn't converge, and all the figures of merit are exactly the same, and you can't complain because you're told in the instruction manual this won't work. But I'm going to then maximize the entropy, do the likelihood analysis, histogram matching, and get some maps. The remarkable thing is that when you do that, you get a whole set of solutions from Superflip that all look the same. You feed them into the maximum entropy program and do likelihoods. They're not all the same. Suddenly, one or two solutions come out with positive likelihoods. The rest are negative, which indicates you've done worse than random. But nonetheless, so here's ZSM10. This is two angstrom resolution data, which shouldn't work. But the solutions are sitting there. 
Right. And what about organics from powder data? Well, this is a database that uh, Bill David and Ken Shankland and Alistair Florence have put together. I'm not sure about its current status because I went to get some data from it recently and it wasn't there, but Kenneth can tell you about that. But it's a beautiful resource. It's full of uh, or organic data collected, mostly in lab data. So what am I trying to do here? I, what I'm doing is trying to find molecular envelopes. I'm actually just taking, the, taking off the low resolution data off this and trying to find an envelope. And just to see whether you can do that. This is, again is a bit of a dumb sort of thing to do. You take a set of powder data and you put it into a program that's not supposed to work with this sort of data. It works with powder data but not this resolution. But I had a project student and the project student was not the brightest person in the world and I had to think of something for him to do. So um, I just gave him these, the, Kenneth gave us the data and I gave it to the students and said, see what you can do with it, expecting and hoping never to see him again. <laughs> but as luck would have it, oh, wait a minute, let's forget about those. He came back with maps that looked like this, sort of things where you're not necessarily finding the atoms, but you're certainly finding envelopes. I was quite gobsmacked, I have to say. It meant I saw a lot of him, which wasn't such good news. Uh, but um, this is then another way of solving powder structures by using superflip to feed into maximum entropy. Doesn't always work. You often get maps that look like this that are a bit of a mess that aren't really interpretable. Right, so it's, it's a quick process. These sorts of data sets, 10 to 15 minutes, half an hour on the laptop, and the MICE program, a couple of minutes. Just to point out, you can permute overlapped reflections. And this gets you into really quite deep water. And I will not go through all that lot. But if you have to do permutations or things with overlaps, there's a point I want to make. You can rephrase your... If you're going to permute overlaps, you're going to have to decide the intensities under the envelope and the phases under the envelope. So you've got a lot of information you need. And if you write it out in a traditional form, it looks very daunting and really rather unwieldy to use. But if you use the idea of hyperspheres, in which you have then... and pseudo-phases, you can reduce the whole idea of calculating of splitting up a, an overlap, you can reduce to just a question of determining things called hyperphases here, pseudophases. And I don't want to go into the detail, just to point out that can be done. If you've got envelopes, you can use this information. If you've got an envelope information, that's prior information. How am I doing for time? Okay, that's good. I've only got another 100 slides, so I should be okay. Um, if you've got a, an envelope, that's information, that's prior information. If you're working with maximum entropy, you can feed that into the calculation. That you've got an envelope and that what you would like to do is build density inside the envelope and not outside it. And you can do that with things called a density building functions in a maximum overlap environment. And you can start with a low-resolution envelope and move into high-resolution data. So that's just another point. That's probably, yep, that's probably good enough. I've, I've, I don't collect data. I just write computer programs. I'm not smart enough to collect data. So all these people have provided me with data and with lots of interactions. And I'm very grateful to them. And I'm very grateful to you for not falling asleep. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, for this marvelous talk. It's open for questions now, please. Oh, hello, I'm Henrik from Stockholm University again. Uh, anyway, uh, what is that software you're using called? Oh, is called it possible to download it anywhere? Right, yeah, this is a good point. The, the program is called MICE. Uh, you are welcome to a copy. Anybody who wants one, come along with a memory stick uh, towards the end of this meeting. I want to tidy it up. 
It comes with a health warning. It comes with several health warnings. It was written 20 years ago when my computer I was using had a megabyte of memory. So it spends most of its life moving data on and off disks, and, pull, and I've never really changed that. It, please don't look at the Fortran code. It is an embarrassment. And secondly, as it stands at the moment, it will only work well, under SIGWIN, the, Windows, the Linux emulator for Windows. So if you want to run it on a Windows computer, it's dead easy. Download SIGWIN. That only takes about five days, but you download SIGWIN <laughs> and get it running, and then the, the software just loads and runs on it. Uh, and it's all free, so, but you are welcome to a copy. That also comes with the database of codes and experimental designs as well. So it has its uses. Thank you very much for your talk. I have two questions concerning histogram matching. Uh, Dan from ETH Zurich. So uh, for three-dimensional structures, histogram, whatever, random maps, if you know the atom numbers, the atom type, the histogram looks similar. This is easy to understand. But I've tried the SM5 zeolite with different projections. The histogram looked quite different. And how you use this histogram to fi filter out bad solutions this is the one question. The second question is that, if I understand correctly, use histogram matching to filter out bad solutions in the final stage. And have you tried with this maximal entropy procedure combined with the histogram matching during the modification of the maps, will this give better result or not? I'm just curious about this. Thank you. Two very good questions. I'll do the last one first. The answer is yes, I've thought about actually modifying the density it goes along with histograms and it's not particularly difficult to do but I haven't done it yet uh, and secondly yes if you look down different projections the histograms will look different but your th the technique I'm using is really quite crude it's a very broad brush I'm just trying to get rid of the complete rubbish and so it's it, what I'm using isn't that sensitive I mean, if you have better information, you can use it, but I'm not bothering with that. I'm, I'm just saying this is roughly what I expect. So if I get a solution that's got four pe a peak at each origin, it'll say, uh-uh, this is wrong. Okay, so it's not a sophisticated method. Okay, so I think it's, uh, I mean, from my test, it's sort of, uh, it can rule out the uranium solutions, yes. for sure. Yes. Okay. But the idea of doing that, act, that's a passive use. The idea of using it actively in an actual maximum entry procedure is a very good one. So if anyone would like to take this computer program and put that in, be my guest. Thank you. Uh, does it work? Yes. I'm uh, Sven Holmeller from Stockholm University. And uh, I, I was wondering, you show a lot of... Uh, uh, results from very limited data sets down to two reflections. That's quite heroic. But uh, now with electron diffraction, the trend is to get uh, complete 3D data to one angstrom or maybe even better. So now you get thousands of reflections. I thought that might take longer than on your computer. Uh, what about uh, complete data sets? The computing time is related, you're quite right, to, to, the, to how much data you've got and its resolution. The maximum entry method, as I've implemented it, spends a lot of time calculating maps, Fourier transforming and pulling back again. So the key time is how long it takes to do a Fourier transform. If you've got low resolution data, it doesn't take very long. If you've got a full set of 3D data, it's going to be quite slow. And it's going to take at least 10 times longer. Yeah, oh yeah, I've tried it with high resolution data. Uh, it's not so easy to solve structures that way. It works, but not as well. And one of the problems is that at high resolution, the maximum entropy method, ha as I've implemented it, tends to start building maps with little bits of spurious data in it. So you get a slight little false peak somewhere. And that false peak can then start to grow if you're not careful. It, so you get little stones in your map and they start to grow and become much too big and then the ones you want start to disappear. 
So it needs a lot more control than I'm giving it. And actually, density histograms might be a way of doing that. But it's not competitive with other methods with that sort of data, and I wouldn't use it unless you were stuck. A microphone. This. When you create new uh, new reflections, uh, aren't you afraid to to get uh, to, uh, to to be in false, to be in ghosts? You've got to be very careful when you put <laughs> new reflections into the calculation. Yeah. Maximum entropy will predict reflections, their phases and their amplitudes. Mm. So if you add new reflections to that set, you want to surprise the calculation. Mm. Mm. So a natural fact, you give it information about things it can't predict. At the current stage, you look at what it can predict and then put information in about what it can't predict. That forces it away from a false minimum because you're quite right. If you put in what it's predicting, mm. it'll fall into a minimum and the chances are that's a false one. Yeah, I, I would like to say you a, a few words more. Okay. No, no problem. Yeah, find me a coffee, if you wish. Okay, so um, don't run away. We have two more announcements. First, I would like to thank Chris again for his talk. And now uh, we have uh, first an announcement from Sven Hoffmann.